Thomas worked in Chittagong Hill Tracks for uh, a good number of time and he has prepared a geological map of Chittagong Hill Track, which is the only map available till date and it's an excellent map. So uh, these are the audience uh, Thomas. Yes. Uh, so uh, please take over and have it. All right, thank I you. Think you have uh, 40, 45 minutes for okay. the lecture and then followed by question and answer for another 10 or 15 minutes. Very good. Right. Okay, okay, yeah. So you tell me when I get to 45 minutes or someone. Okay. Then when I talk to them all, you tell me. <laughs> uh, okay, as uh, Dr. Imam said, you know, I'm a geologist uh, from California. I'll try to uh, speak uh, slowly and clearly. Uh, sometimes I get talking too fast. Uh, at times I have trouble with uh, understanding exactly what is being asked. And But I'll, we'll, we'll get it fixed. We'll get it worked out. Uh, I put this diagram up to start with. It's got uh, some information up in the corner uh, here. Up there, and it's got, uh, we have a web page. I have a company, oops, that, uh, let me get this one out. Okay, so I have uh, a consulting company, and uh, on that web page, there's a lot of information that you can download for free, and you can see what I've been up to for the last uh, 40 years uh, working in geology. Now, uh, I'm a structural geologist in my background, although uh, probably the last 20 years I've, I've gotten more into developing prospects um, both domestically and uh, internationally. And so I've got more into the business side of it than the economics. So I, I still do structural geology. In fact, I still do field work. Uh, if you go on to that uh, page, you'll see that even recently we've been working out in uh, Death Valley National Park, California, in the desert, uh, which is a great place for structural geology. Okay, the reason I put this diagram up uh, to begin with is it explains some concepts that we use commonly in interpreting uh, seismic lines or making cross-sections from just steel data where we don't have seismic lines. And uh, what the uh, diagram on top here shows is the different types of uh, trap styles that you can get in a compressional belt, like the Chittagong Hills. Um, and these belts, uh, these compressional belts, are worldwide and quite a number of them have a very prolific uh, oil and gas provinces. Uh, and luckily, when I started out uh, after, uh, after graduating from college, I worked in a couple of different thrust belts for an uh, international oil company and got a lot of experience in these types of belts. Uh, what we're showing in that diagram is the various trap styles. So you can get this the normal amount line that's expressed to the surface. Uh, by strike and dips, uh, and this would be what you would see in a landsat image of the uh, Chittagong Hills uh, belt. Uh, but you can also get um, small structures up against uh, steep bolts that may not express themselves completely to the surface. So you need seismic or well control to, to work that out. You can also get uh, pinch outs. You can get uh, combination stratigraphic traps like shown here, the green on here is essentially showing where uh, it's diagrammatic, but where the oil accumulations might be. And so that little sand layer there that is uh, pinching out, and the idea is these are all coming from the San Joaquin Basin in California. It's a very rich oil basin in California. It has about 20 billion barrels of recoverable, or oil that's been recovered cumulative so far and there are probably another five billion barrels in there. So uh, the diagram is kind of from that, but the concepts apply to a lot of different areas. And the idea here was that the sands, we know that there are sands that pinch out on the sides of structures, and that's because the structures are growing at the same time as the sands are being deposited. So it adds a different, uh, an additional uh, track style. and. Uh, uh, the red on here are faults. Uh, you see it's a series of low angle faults. And then some places you might have a landslide or a thrust fault covering up an anticline and maybe you only see this portion in the surface geology. 
And then a, a common uh, trap style we see in California is up under the thrust, we just get an oil trap uh, in beds right under the, the thrust, and we've got fine grain uh, rocks like shale or siltstone in the hanging wall that traps that oil for migrating surface. Same thing here. And uh, we also get these uh, kind of wedge effect uh, where it's like a, like a, you could think of an axe, like a, 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 an axe used for cutting wood being driven into a log and the bottom blade of the axe is going forward and then the top that is going back. So that's, that's, my, that's more or less the simple analogy of a wedge structure. <laughs> So you get this piece here being driven into the rock here, and the slip goes off to the right, and then it goes back up, up along a back thrust here. So they're, they're quite complex, these belts. And uh, uh, you try to use all the data that you can get. It can be surface geology, it can be well data, previous wells that have been drilled in there. And I don't know what happened there. Did I do something? <laughs> uh, and uh, anyway. Uh, the fold models we actually use, in addition, are down here. And there's two main uh, end members, I call them, of uh, fold types that are common in thrust belts. One to fault, bend the fold, and you may have seen these before. Uh, you've got a set of layered rocks, sedimentary rocks, and then you have a fault here, that black line steps up, it ramps. It's called a ramp, and then it goes flat again. So that's a detachment. That's a detachment. And when you do that, the rocks on the top here are moving to the right. And it forces a fold to be formed. So the back limb between which, it's hard to make these letters out of your life here, but B and B prime and the, the little Ys down here. You produce a back limb here uh, because the rocks have to ride up. Okay, And uh, when they do that, they can't go into the other rocks. You know, they're, they're sliding up, so they produce this back limb. And then they produce also a front limb. And then with time, with more slip applied to the model, this back limb, that piece there, grows. It gets wider and wider. And then this limb also widens. And it also, uh, that axis, we call these axis or axes. And this one is somewhere static, like this one stays in one place all the time. This one stays in one place. But, uh, excuse me, that one there stays in one place. These, that's an active one, an active one. Uh, in other words, they migrate. So you can see from here, the A prime axis has migrated uh, out. And then if you get more slip, then the fold gets bigger and bigger, uh, wider and wider. And this is uh, typical of thrust belts throughout the world, a uh, 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 fold and fold. And we use, uh, because the seismic option is not good, or the, we don't have it, or we're, we're trying to interpret from surface geology or well data, we use these models quite a bit to at least come up with some idea of what's going on down below the surface. Also, these models are restorable, and that means you can pull them apart. You can start from this uh, uh, setting, the, the present day setting, and you can backslip it all the way to this and then beyond to uh, just unfolded rocks. And that's a test. That's an important test on your cross-sections or your seismic interpretation. Can you pull it apart? And so we call that uh, kinematic restoration. Um, and uh, you can end up with several different interpretations. And then you try to pick the simple, hopefully you pick the simplest one, or you get some other data to uh, figure out which one is the most reasonable. But a lot of cross-sections you'll see in the literature uh, are not restorable. So we would label those as invalid, uh, and there's something wrong with them, and they need to be revised. Now, another type of fold you can see here is a fold propagation fold. And that's just like, a, think of a, the floor with a rug, a, a small rug that you can slide around. And if you put your foot on one side of the rug, and then the other foot in, on the back of the rug, and you slide it, you know, towards you, it buckles up. It's a rug going to buckle up. Okay. Well, that's a, a, an analogy or an analog to a fault propagation fault. Okay. And in that one, start with a detachment, too, and then it steps up. 
But the false slip is all consumed in making the photo here. Okay? And, you get, and so that's step one. Step two, the fold gets bigger. You've got more slip. You've got this back wind growing. And then this would be the sort of final stage. And really, in, the, in, in fold belts, you get a combination of these things. I mean, sometimes you see pure ramp folds or fold end folds. Sometimes you see pure uh, fold propagation folds. But more commonly, you see folds with some combination of those. And the reason I wanted to show this slide was that uh, what I'm going to talk about today is going to, I'm going to use that kind of thinking quite a bit. So I need to switch my slides here. Hold on one second. Andaman 
French uh, part of it. You got the Indo-Burman ranges uh, that would be, you know, more or less just the east of the uh, Chittagong uh, Fold Belt uh, hills. And then you cross into there's some basement rock that comes up, some crystalline rock here, um, and uh, then you have the central uh, basin depression which this is where most of the onshore oil and gas is in uh, Myanmar, Burma. And then you have your soggy fall here, so the plate boundary is here, okay? And uh, all the purple shown on here, that's uh, continental crust, so that's light crust. And then the darker color, that's your oceanic crust coming down here. And then because uh, 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 there was a, a certain amount of extension back here at one time, there's a, it's hotter than, uh, normal average mantle situation going on here today. And so the, the similarity in, in, to California is uh, back, this is setting today of course, but back about 50 million years ago, in fact from about 250 million years to about 40 million years ago, this situation, this setting, this, this what was going on in California. And uh, this is the Sierra Nevada here, and this would be the Great Valley of California. Um, and this is a forward uh, basin. And then you would have um, what we call an accretionary wedge situation, very much like this, um, uh, in the coast ranges of California. And uh, you had a, the plate, the plate that was out uh, west of North America called the Fairlawn Plate, it was being subducted. Okay. And then that changed about uh, 35 million years ago, 30 million years ago. And now, and then we went from this convergent boundary, subduction boundary, we went to this picture here. So this area is not, this is more like what it looked like back from 40 million years to 215 years ago, the city here. And, uh, uh, but this province here in, uh, this is where all the oil and gas is in, uh, in in California, or most of it. And so that, that's one of the reasons we were drawn to this central uh, uh, basin uh, complex in uh, Myanmar. And they, of course, have the oil there. Can you move the next slide for me? Uh, I'll just go quickly. Yeah, OK. So here's the uh, uh, picture of the central, the yellow one here is the central uh, depression, basin depression. And it's broken up into several sub basins. And uh, the green dots are the oil fields. So you can see it's pretty much within the onshore oil here, it's pretty much within uh, the central basin depression, the CBD here. And then the sub basins are named like that. And uh, uh, of course, these are gas fields that are offshore. And most of the interest in Myanmar in the last 20 years has been, um, you know, with the uh, uh, gas exploration uh, offshore in the NMC and then some in the Joaquin uh, fold belt too. And so Bangladesh has certainly some possibilities adjacent to that uh, here. And we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail because there's not a, enough time. Uh, but if you go onto the web page uh, that I have, uh, that Thomas L. Davis uh, geologist.com. You'll, you'll find a map similar to this, and there's all these cross sections. And uh, they're free to download. You can look at those. And, uh, there's some discussion in there of, the, of what it's showing uh, as far as convergence across the belt. Let's see if I can do this without messing it up. Oh, okay. Now we're done. Uh, so, what in the uh, in the central basin depression in Myanmar, you have these large old oil fields. It's like this white sea here, Yin uh, Chok, and then another one here, Yin uh, Yan. I think that's right here. They're just large anticline, very similar to what would be in the uh, Chittagong Hills. And then the uh, uh, Indo-Burman ranges are showing up here. The Sagaing Fault showed them here, and uh, this is a picture of the San Andreas Fault, uh, and that's the San Joaquin Valley with, the, I mentioned, 20 million barrels of cumulative oil in there, uh, Elk Hills, Planet Vista, they're very large oil fields. And uh, 
know, the old picture uh, up until about 20 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, was that the San Andreas Fault produced this kind of structure. This was the dominant interpretation of what was going on. You had this, it's called a flower structure, a palm tree structure, given various names, and that these big anaclines that were out here in the trap well were somehow related to these uh, faults that steepen with depth and, and go into the San Andreas. We know now that that's not the case. Um, that, uh, and that, that picture more or less uh, is based on what we call the high drag distributed shear model. Okay, and that means the crust, uh, the upper crust was very strong and it was very difficult for the uh, uh, for the movement to take place along the fault and the, and the strain to be distributed. We know now that actually the fault, at least in shallow levels in the upper few kilometers, is decoupled. And uh, what that does is it produces a free boundary, almost a stress-free boundary in here. And it means that uh, your convergent uh, stresses are more perpendicular to the plate boundary. Well, what that does is it produces thrust faults uh, on either side of the belt. And we know this from seismic and uh, drilling, uh, looking for additional oil in here. And so this decoupled model, or low drag model, uh, explains better here. So what does that have to do with looking for oil and gas? Well, it means that the structures that you see, uh, there's a lot more running room. There's a lot more place to explore uh, in this model or in the fault bend fold model, where you have these ramp anaclines, there's a lot more room uh, than there is in this model. This model had a very limited amount of silt thrust area. Uh, so it does have implications uh, for oil and gas. And uh, so we applied this to uh, the central basin depression. Uh, and you can, you know, with, this is not a very good, uh, image, but it's a seismic image, and you can see there's one of these uh, fault propagation folds. The thrust would be right in here, like this. And, it, and it's actually a back thrust. There's a deeper thrust, uh, and it steps up, and then it slips back to the anticline. And, the and uh, this, these are some cross-sections that were published, and, and they show the same similar thing. Here's a, uh, a thrust stepping up. It's got a ramp in it here. It goes flat in here. It produces a hanging wall in in fact, that's a, that's a hanging wall in here. And so, uh, and this cross-section here uh, shows you more or less this cross-section down here, which was published actually before these two pictures uh, were published. And uh, this model here, uh, cross-section, shows this the basin and uh, the, uh, you know, the oil fields that I mentioned, the older oil fields, uh, there in this line of structure here is actually, it's more complicated than this, of course. And then a uh, soggy fault would be way up to the, to the right here. And then there's a series of thrusts going the other direction that produce a line. A lot of these things that are away from these, these central basin, uh, or center basin oil fields, they, they have not been drilled. Uh, Myanmar has, for a variety of reasons uh, that I won't get into right now, it's not had a lot of uh, exploration within the full drag itself. There's a lot of history in this place. It was, you know, like um, Bangladesh, like Pakistan, India. It was all part of, you know, at one point, British, uh, the British Indian Empire. Or, uh, and uh, there was, you know, there was oil discovered here long before uh, the bridge showed up, and this is uh, uh, some oil that was just being, you know, hand dug pits, and they were extracting oil. Uh, so it's had a, the Central Basin Depression has had a long history of oil production. Of course, there were uh, English companies that got in here, uh, and then it's got a history of in World War II, where the Japanese seized the oil fields. And anyway, Burma, uh, Myanmar suffered greatly from World War II. Uh, that's another kind of side history. Uh, this is, shows you what the, these, some of these anaclines uh, that have oil in them look like. They're long, narrow, 
structures bounded on one side by a reverse level. There it is there. So this is a cross section across it. And there's multiple horizons. This is all sandstone and shale. It's fairly shallow marine uh, deposits. Uh, not tremendously old. It's all uh, upper Oligocene, Miocene. Uh, there's a little bit of oil left actually in the Pliocene rocks. And then they have footwear production too. So you can see there's a little trap here. Very similar to what we see in California. And uh, the oil is, uh, you know, the chemistry of the oil is a little different in California because it's derived from a non or a shallow marine source rock. Uh, and so it's very waxy, crude, uh, and uh, it so it, it and it can have a fairly high API and gravity uh, down here. I think it's running about 40 here. So uh, it's got some engineering issues that need to be dealt with, but there seems to be a lot of oil there. All right. This uh, diagram shows you kind of what the uh, uh, stratigraphy, uh, the producing stratigraphy is in here. Here's your source rocks. And again, they're almost, except for way down in, in here, they're almost all uh, shell marine, uh, gas prone, type 2, type 3, kerogen. Here's your reservoirs, multiple reservoirs. And then there's good ceiling uh, lithology in here. And, uh, you know, in some ways these rocks would be uh, uh, somewhat similar to what you have uh, in, uh, you, you know, in Bangladesh, in the, in the southern portion of Bangladesh. Uh, uh, it, it's a different setting, but because it was so influenced by the rivers coming from the north, from the, the growing Himalayas, it's, it's, it's pretty similar in a lot of ways. And then this shows the various, uh, some of the oil fields and the, what, where the oil is. And there's a pretty good book, this Rid and Racy book on the geology, petroleum geology of Myanmar. Here, this diagram, I mean, it kind of shows you the same stuff on here, but here they've taken, they have vitronite reflectance on here. So you can see some of the deeper source rocks are now in the, in the gas window. Uh, but a lot of the, the source rock up here, even though it's in the oil window, it's really gas from And then there's a uh, geohistory diagram. So uh, uh, here you have the ages of the rocks. Uh, and here you have depth in meters. Uh, the red arrow is when you get peak generations. So what you see here is pretty much uh, as India was closing in on, on Asia, uh, uh, the Asian part of or uh, the part of Asia to the east of uh, Myanmar, you had subsidence and big, you know, very basic development. And then when the, uh, at some point, you know, the collision, the convergence took over, and then you started uplifting everything and bringing it back up, okay. So the yellow here it shows what's in early stage of maturity, and there's your R values, 0.5 to 0.7. And then uh, mid maturity, and then late, and then the main gas generation. So you know some of the deeper rocks, like if you go back into the Paleocene, Cretaceous, they've actually gone into the gas window today, and now they've been popped up. So and again, you could probably make a similar, somewhat similar diagram uh, in parts of Bang uh, Bangladesh that would look somewhat like this, where you have a lot of subsidence, pretty thick basin. And then um, it would all pop back up, uh, and that would end the that red arrow is peak generation of your hydrocarbons. And uh, you know this is more or less showing the same thing. Um, you know we've got this long period of subsidence, and then we got uplift. And here's the various rock units here. There's still a question in Myanmar about whether these older Cretaceous and Paleocene rocks. Uh, have source value. There's just not enough known about where these out, they outcrop, uh, and they rarely get drilled into or, uh, so there's just not a lot of information yet uh, on it, and they should have source rock value too. So what I did is, uh, you remember the cross-section I showed you earlier here, 
this is uh, one that uh, Tiffnik made back in the late 90s. And so I've modified this. I've taken those fold models. Uh, this is very generalized. But it gives us a picture of what might be possible uh, in Myanmar, just re you know, revising this older interpretation. And these TZs are triangle zones. So we know from other work that's been done in here, more detailed work, that this thrust, and there's two thrust systems here that appear separate along strike, and then they override each other. So we know there's a triangle zone here. And what I mean by triangle zone is in the footwall, we've developed a, uh, a fold. It's probably due to some deeper uh, ramp and a deeper thrust. And then uh, these are detachments, of course. And we're speculating on one down here. Uh, near this uh, chalk field, um, but it gives us something to start with. So you can take this kind of interpretation and use those old models I showed you earlier, and then build them, you know, and uh, it, it gives you something to work with. Okay, so here's, when I say triangle zone, that's what the TZs are. Here's one, a model for California. These are actually very well known uh, throughout uh, fold depths worldwide. And, and they can be quite, quite uh, prolific as far as oil. In the Canadian Rockies, uh, most of the gas, uh, and they have a lot of natural gas, uh, most of it is actually trapped in this kind of triangle zone structure in here. So you have a, uh, a detachment, steps up, makes an anticline, and then it doesn't propagate out into the basin, it backslips. Okay. So it, again, think of that as like a wedge being driven into something. And the bottom of it, the block is uh, above it is moving out. And then um, above that, there's another, uh, above the wedge, there's slip going back the other way. And so there's no need to send slip out here. This consumes all the slip. Uh, you can restore this uh, back to, uh, you know, its undeformed state. And that blue fit here. And just, yellow brown color would fit back in here if you were to pull it apart. Um, this um, this is this area right here. So you have a seismic here and we were speculating that not only do we have a possibility of something in the football, but there appears to be pinch outs right in here as this structure uh, grew. So that was the point of, you know, this would be a combination structural stratigraphic trap as this uh, weight wheel thrust grew, sediments were being laid down, and they pinched out on the side of it. Okay, some other places um, that again, the outside of the central part of the of the basin. Mm. Okay, about that. Okay. Outside uh, of this area, it's not very well explored. There's only a few wells, and this area is almost totally unexplored. The full belt um, and, and down here. So you get away at all from the real the center of the, the central basin depression, um, then there's not much in the way of well data and, and, and seismic too. So here's an example of a again, uh, a low angle fall that ramps up. It's making a fold here, but the, the anticline's actually been eroded away. It was down here somewhere and it got eroded away. Got, keep in mind, the uplift rate here is pretty high and the erosion rate is pretty high, so the structures, you know, it's, there's a lot of eroded structures uh, back in the fold belt. Anyway, there was a well drilled through here and it hit a, 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 an accumulation and then yet went down and cut another fall and down here. So we're suspecting here there's a couple of triangle zones down here, uh, possibilities to follow up on. Uh, we added the TV. Here's another one. This is seismic, uh, line drawing of a seismic line. You've got an anticline up here, back wind here, football area, football here. So you've got possibility of oil trapped up under the fault here. Again, all these, these low angle faults add a lot to what we call the money room. In other words, um, if the faults just steepen quickly, then it doesn't, there's not much space or land area there for you to explore with. But if they're low angle, 
like this. And it, it adds all this additional room. And so when you go and do your economics on it, and uh, even, you know, like very basic economics, the amount of area that you've got to explore in is very important. You know, if, if, especially in a, you know, oil and gas rich area. If you've got, if you double that area, in California we've got triple the area by adding the thrust of that model to it. Okay, so this shows you, uh, I'm combining California, and uh, which is the cross section on the top. This cross section is on that web page too. You can uh, download a, a more detailed version of this thing. And uh, so we got a thrust belt here. Um, there's a series of thrusts here. They're, they're the black lines on here, and they're. Uh, stepping up or you know, the whole block situation here is moving out into the, this is the main San Joaquin Basin here. And the basin is very deep. Um, I don't have, it's hard to read the scale, but this is about 20,000 feet depth, you know, so uh, probably on the order of uh, maybe uh, like, uh, like six kilometers or something like that down here. The red, uh, red uh, vertical lines up here, these are all wells. This is an oil field. There's a little oil field back here. And one of the things that makes this so rich is you got this structure right here, this amphorm structure, and you got this deep basin generating oil. I mean, if, if the oil, all the oil has got to do is migrate up the faults or up the sand beds and into the structure. Okay. And this is one of the reasons that San Joaquin Basin is so rich, uh, is we have these deep holes like that that uh, get the source rock down to great depth and then um, uh, you know, they generate oil and they go right up into the structures here. And uh, so the, the general model is we started out with something like this uh, back about maybe five or six million years ago. This, this is all very young deformation, mostly in the last maybe four million years. So if you go back to maybe five or six million years ago, we, we have oil that has migrated up in some places up against normal faults. So back at five or six million years ago, the area was undergoing extension, not uh, convergence, not compression. So we had a different style of deformation. In fact, this fault here, this big bounding fault between the crystalline basement and the basin here, that's an old normal fault. And what happened is uh, then you brought convergence, compression into the picture, and so it worked this fault, it actually rolled it over. It used to extend up here, but then this, this propagated grew over the upper part of this fault. And in doing so, it created a lot of unusual traps, and that's shown diagrammatically in here. So you get not only the, uh, the simple ampline, and, and this area has been drilled since, I mean, they discovered oil at this, it's called Wheeler Ridge. They discovered oil here back, uh, a hundred years ago, more than a hundred years ago. Um, in fact, if, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie There Will Be Blood. Uh, well, it's about this area, you know, this, that comes from that time. And so it was drilled with not rotary drilling, but actually uh, cable tool type uh, drilling. Uh, and then, so when you located these normal faults, um, they, you know, they remained as traps where they grew in importance as traps. And uh, so you'll get not only the anaclinal trap here, but you'll get these uh, uh, stand, these vertical traps here um, that uh, uh, you, you need to, what you do is you drill, you put the rig out here, you go down, and then at some point you sidetrack it over so you intersect these beds at a high angle. And we think this is what's going on in Myanmar Okay, that this invalid anticline has this possibility here, so that there could be football oil here or here or up in this triangle zone area, and uh, but it's yet to be yet to be tested. Uh, and this uh, gives you some idea of the hydrocarbon resources uh, within Myanmar. It's getting a little old. This 2000. 15. Uh, the problem in Myanmar now is politics, of course. 
uh, and uh, uh, you know, not much is going on. Most of the activity that was going on in the last 10 years, and even that has ceased, is in the gas offshore area here. But it's, you know, it's, it's got a, a lot of remaining potential um, in it. Uh, so th this is still attractive. If the politics get settled, uh, then I think uh, uh, Burma or Myanmar will come back and uh, open the area up to uh, exploration, and there will be uh, companies coming back. Let's see what else I got here. Uh, just more of the same. This is old because a lot of these people have a lot of these companies that are shown on here. They've actually left the country uh, until the politics get settled out. The same here. It shows you a little bit what uh, uh, the daily oil and gas production is declining rapidly. Uh, that's one. They have a energy problem uh, and. Uh, in Myanmar, uh, because the oil, those old oil fields are declining very quickly. Now, they, they're good candidates for thermal recovery. I don't know if you're acquainted with that, but a lot of the oil is heavy, so they're probably, you, they've only recovered maybe 20, 30 percent of the oil that's in place, and uh, it's heavy, waxy crude, so it's a, there would be, uh, for enhanced oil recovery, um, uh, there would, there's some good opportunities here. Uh, the other thing is that since they have a lot of natural gas in uh, offshore, you know, they were selling uh, to China, to Malaysia, some to Thailand. Uh, that they, they had so much gas that uh, they, were, they sort of overwhelmed from the pipeline. So these old oil fields would make perfect gas storage fields. I, I don't know if you know, we have those in California. Gas storage fields are, we bring the natural gas in by pipeline from outside of California. It comes, a lot of it comes from Canada, some of it comes from the state of Wyoming. And uh, the way gas is used in Southern California, or California in general, is because it fluctuates so much in its use, you have to have some place to store it. The, the pipelines, uh, methane, natural gas travels through pipelines pretty slowly. So you, and the population in Southern California is quite large. So the demand can really change very quickly. So gas storage fields became the solution for the problem. And you bring the gas in by pipeline, you inject it into this, an old oil field, and then when you need it, you can, it's right there. You can, uh, you can uh, retrieve it very quickly. Um, and there's a number of big oil fields in California that are now used as gas storage fields. So something that uh, in the future uh, uh, Myanmar could, could utilize with, because they have a situation where they, at times they have too much gas. And the other advantage of it is that you can pay for everything, but at least this is what's happening in California, is you can pay for the cost of developing the field and purchasing the field and all that stuff. Because when you pump methane down there, it mobilizes the oil, the heavy oil. It's another enhanced oil recovery technique. So it lowers the, the gravity of the oil, and you start producing not only natural gas, but you start producing a fair amount of oil. Again. And those oil sales, uh, the companies that have, that operate those uh, natural gas or the storage shields, natural gas storage shields, right? they they pay for those fields several times over just by the oil sales alone. You know, so it was a, and of course they're making money selling gas to the, you know, to the power companies or to the, the public. Uh, so it, it's actually a pretty good deal. Let me see what else I have here. Uh, this shows you kind of what's happening. Again, it's a little dated, um, but it, it's, this top graph shows you the onshore oil production going back to 75, and you can see it's declining. If I, I could fill this out now to 2019, I think. I've got the number. And it's, it's way down. It's down around, it, it's down around 2,000 uh, barrels per day. And it, it, they just don't have a lot anymore. And then the gas, of course, uh, this has jumped up through here. So you know, that's all these discoveries they made. 
uh, in offshore. So the gas was going up, at least until the political situation went bad about two years ago, and uh, now it's plateaued off. And uh, a lot of the big companies like Chevron and Woodside, they've left the, com the country, so they've turned the operation over to uh, smaller, uh, more regional players in the field. Um, how are we doing time-wise? Just about 40 minutes. Okay. Um, let's see, what else can I... I've got five more minutes? Yeah, sure. Okay. Let me uh, switch, because that's kind of the end of that one. Oh, let's, maybe there's questions right now, and then I can... Or do you want to do it that way, or just go on? I think we can finish your lecture. Okay. All right. Go on, sir. Uh, 
you know, anywhere from several hundred million barrel uh, cumulative uh, to several billion barrel oil fields. So it's a very rich area. Uh, got good source rock, good reservoir rock. And so we, again, in expanding this uh, running room, we've made this area very attractive for the future. I think I'm going to stop there. And that would keep up the most of time. And okay, uh, David, thank you very much. You are very, very I'll invite questions for David, if you have. Uh, I would like to start with uh, uh, people from outside and seniors, and then we will follow by questions from students. So please, ask a question. Uh, I'm, I'm Gavin. Uh, do you have any Bangladesh side data? I mean, the Sita Computer's recent data, and how could you resemble with that model, conceptual model, with our side data? Yeah. I, I, okay, so in the mid 90s, I worked for UMC. Okay. And they had some size because they, they, we did a big field work, like actually out of the field. And we had one or times two helicopters, and we had boats, and we got all around the Chittagong Hills. And I produced this map uh, that you can actually download from my webpage, where if you give me your card, I can send you anymore. Um, and uh, it was pretty detailed, uh, but the map that I have now is pretty generalized compared to the map that we actually made for United Meridian. I guess my point is, we did the field work. I was not an employee. I was, a, I was hired as a field consultant. And I turned most of that data over to UMC, who ran the seismic later. And I didn't see the final report, or I don't have the final report. So I don't have a lot of the information that they finally produced. So I assume that they turned that over but I don't know that. Yeah, that's normally the way it, it works, you know. But the fact that they disappeared as a company, I don't know. Well, uh, anyway, uh, so I don't have any seismic data. I never was in the situation where I could interpret their seismic. Uh, I, we did make those cross sections uh, that, uh, that I showed. In one point, or again, I can, if you give me a card, I can send you. We, we do have three cross sections that we made. But what I have is the, what they produced uh, in the kind of interim stage was a, a report. Uh, it was an interim report. And uh, it had my, what we did in the field and the cross sections. And, and so that's, and it was all sort of generalized, the mapping and all that stuff to go into a report. So that's what I have. You know, the, all the other stuff that I did was turned over to the UMC. And, and I don't have it, you know, but that's, that's the city. Yeah. Uh, just Davis, to add to this, actually, I explored out your web page this morning. OK, let me start uh, introduce myself. I'm Abdus Samad Ajat. I'm working in the same company. OK. I'm working as a geologist, and he's working as a geophysicist. Okay, so I, I, I looked at your web page and downloaded a few things. You proposed a web in Castle and Anticline, if I'm not wrong, in uh -huh. 1999. Right. Yeah. They did. I did not. But you did. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. then you prepared the, the, so the map. Yeah, and yeah. You the, provided with some sort of cross sections. Right, right. And, and as I looked into your maps, it looks that you choose Castle because it is it looks a bit simplistic anticline if you compare it to other anticlines that you have in the eastern side, right. if I'm not wrong. Right. So, uh, but you do not know why they didn't went for uh, drilling uh, the way well there. I, no, I don't. I, I wasn't around uh, for the rest of that. Uh, I don't you know what yeah, happened with that. The <laughs> company uh, decision to pull out from uh, Bangladesh and South Asia. Yeah. That's right. It's nothing to do with the prospect uh, of integration. Yeah. So I think the dream was not brought down because of, at that point, the company decided to come out of the Right. The other problem was, you know, when we, when I got into the field there, was in 1986, the, the, the market, this was a boom time for, you know, uh, Southeast Asia economy. It was real boom. And the demand for gas was very high. And then, because uh, we had some other jobs in other places, and uh, the, the, but that, 
I can't recall the, the economic events that, <laughs> that happened, but it all went, you know, went south, so to speak. It went poorly, you know, eventually. And the price of natural gas, you know, uh, just in the region went way down. So that probably was another factor in the not, you know. Uh, you know, natural gas is not like oil, uh, and you probably know this, but, but it's, you've got to really watch yourself. With, and companies really watch the economics and the expenditures with natural gas. I mean, you know, in California, we, can, we drill a well, just we can be some little body, you know, with hardly any <laughs> big money. And if we find something, we can get hire a truck, pull it up there, and fill the tank up with oil, with crude oil, and take it to the refinery and sell it. You know, it's like you're you like farming. You know, you're selling corn. But you can't do that with natural gas. You know, you've got all the stuff that the pipeline and then how pure is the gas, are the public utilities who buy the gas, you know, there's just so many other things that go into so even if you make a discovery in gas, you've got to watch the price of gas and you've got to think about what you're going to spend between, you know, the drilling the well is only part of the cost. You know, it's not like like I said, with oil well it's a lot simpler. You know, that's I, I, that's kind of my simple interpretation of working on both oil prospects and gas prospects, you know, that, that people are, companies are just more careful with natural gas, you know, as far as expenditures. Uh, seeing these new slides, what I realized that really this part of the area need to be reassessed with oh. with a modern structural geology. Oh, yeah. Of course. Yeah. That, that that oh yeah, definitely. You know, and you bring all the data together. I don't know if if some of that some of that data maybe maybe you can reprocess it. We we have a lot of luck with you know, the reprocessing now is so much better than you know just in the last ten years than it was. You know, so if we have data that's 15, 20 years old, we we usually if we have the budget, we usually reprocess it. Just because it improves it so much. I'm Professor Norson Guillo working in the geology department. So I know what I have seen that you from your presentation, that most of the gas and oil is concentrated in the central basin of Myanmar. Mm -hmm. And then if I make an analogy uh, in the California basin, you also have lot of successes in the basinal part of deep region. Yeah. You have the analogy which could be compared with the Chitana Chitana Hillfrax in the California region, which could make us uh, positive and uh, mm. hopeful that we will have also the similar structures. Right. Which parts or most of the parts are exposed, which we consider as the reservoir right. in the Chilean villages. So how could we be hopeful for our building? If we make an analogy with the California basin. Right. This would be the, I mean, <laughs> my approach is kind of that. The one, you know, spent a lot of my professional career working in oil and gas and coal trust belts and the thing. So when you look at <coughs> the Chittagong Hills, uh, or even Myanmar, you, they're very underexplored. The amount of wells compared to the complexity of the belt is, is pretty small. If you if you had stages, you know, one through three or one through four of exploring in a full trust belt, both countries would be at the stage. And you learn the thing that makes them tricky is you learn by drilling or doing more seismic. You know, it, when you first look at it, you drill the simple surface anaclines, and but it's one of these places where if you drill just a couple of wells, your chances of finding something initially like that is not very really good. You know, that it's it's just more complex. And you know, in the best case, you drill and big anaclines, and it turns out to be a big discovery, and that gives you money to explore a lot more and spend a lot more time with other things, but. That often does not happen. And what I've seen in old trust belts is that as people, you know, you'll get one company in there and they'll leave and then another company and then after maybe two or three tries, somebody will make a pretty sizable discovery in there. 
But you know, you're learning as you're going. You know, so it's a very difficult place to put. Uh, you know, the range. You can look at Chittagong Hills and say, well, they're anywhere. You know, you ought to have anywhere from several hundred million barrels to you know to a billion barrels worth of oil. Or what do you do with gas? You know, you say, well, oh, we should have several TCF or you know, or as much as 10 TCF. But it's a big range. And then the more you engineer, you can narrow that range. But initially, you, you have to tell the, the business people and the company, you say, well, you know, it's, uh, it's a wide range. And, uh, but I can, you can use analogies, analogs a lot to improve it. You know, so you can look at what you were suggesting in California, and uh, you can say, well, the simple outlines aren't the only thing that you could have here. You could have thrust faults with <coughs> opportunities below those. You could have places where the oil is trapped up under the thrust faults. You can come down all those things. Yeah. So what we, what we understand from the recently acquired data, and if we also analyze process with process that both uh, seismic data, what we understand that if you go to the central basin or the broad synclinal area, right. so you have a good correlated reflection. Right. But if you come to the uh, structural part, and in the crystal portion, most of the seismic data it's very difficult to reprocess and produce some structural features from there. Mm -hmm. So structural interpretation is really difficult. It's really important. And then we have some success. For example, if you have some concealed structure, for example, Sino, Semutang and Teklai, mm -hmm. who knows? Yeah. But in the most of the other structures, it's very difficult to make a structural, conclusive interpretation. Right. Right. So, yeah, you either... I think it's really yeah, you kind of get stuck, you know. I, I mean, it's kind of um, so what you have to do is one is inexpensive relative uh, to seismic to do more structural interpretation. And there's a lot of you know uh, software programs you know that are pretty good at that, and uh, you can do a lot of that. And then um, if there is any hope with some of that seismic data that maybe UMC shot or to we process it again, you know, and uh, that's that's a hope too. Or uh, I wish we could find the, and I hope they could find the more that the more detailed work that we did for the UMC, because that app is more detailed, and uh, would be uh, be nice to be able to. Yeah. More questions. <coughs> First of, the, first of my question is uh, the first diagram you showed about the Myanmar, the uh -huh. Myanmar range. Uh, there was uh, the area where the attritional prism was forming. Uh -huh. It was highly forted, yeah, highly trusted or faulted. Right. The diagram, yeah. And you said that it was a great prospect for hydrocarbons in Myanmar. Uh -huh. So my question is, um, is the trapping in that area yeah, sustainable for future? I guess because trusting should not be allowed for a good yeah trapping mechanism into the petroleum industry. I guess if I'm not wrong. The now I'm not sure I understand fully. The trapping should be. Should be there was a there were there were a lot of vertical faults in there. So yeah. if you should so yeah. Uh, is the uh, isn't the gas yeah sitting out from that? Oh, the, I know. see. The structures are breached. You mean or eroded? Is that uh, it's 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 vertical faults? Yeah. I, I, I am here among the particles. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is common in thrust belts, and this is why you need to look both at the hanging wall and the foot wall. You need to look below the thrust, you know, that, of course, they would not be breached. Uh, I'm not sure if that's what you're asking about or not. Uh, yeah. Kind of, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, from Fort Hill, the capital geology. My question is uh, you were suggesting that. Uh, in the case of uh, California, there was a convergence 4 to 5 billion years ago, and then the convergence to uh, turn and became a strike slip fall or a transform fall. Over mm -hmm. there. So, are you suggesting that uh, in Myanmar and uh, the Burmese plate or the Sunda plate and in Myanmar, Bangladesh plate, the Eurasian plate, there will be some kind of a transform fall in the few near future? Yes. There should be, um, I mean. But uh, my question is like, 
this is not just a double plate junction, there is a triple plate also here occurring, like a Eurasian plate, mm -hmm. then the Indian plate, and then the Sonda plate itself. Is there any possibilities for this uh, kind of, uh, it's hard to conceive, like there could be a transform fault in here. Yes, you mean between the cinder plate and, uh, and, and the, uh, that, so the plate is, some people refer to that as a microplate for burners, that as a, so you've got the sardine fault there and then, I, I mean the way I look at it is, you just start the main Asian subcontinent uh, to these, but that, there's a series of microplates in there and there are papers where people have suggested that they are bounded by strikes and faults, you know, that uh, there's, for instance, if you go up, I'm not that acquainted with that far east, uh, I have to admit, if you go up into North Vietnam, well, what used to be North Vietnam, in the northern part of Vietnam, you've got the Red River Fault, uh, I don't know if you're acquainted with that, but that's a large strike of fault itself, and it's separating two older plates, uh, so a lot of these older microplates are bounded by strikes of faults. You know. But the thing that you've got to remember is that almost all of them are going to be subject, if they're weak, the important point I guess, this, or at least the way I look at it, is that if that boundary is weak and there's any kind of convergence in there. Model, and then that has been also changed to the latest one where uh, it was uh, discussed. So, uh, David, you uh, noticed yesterday that when the people, uh, the geologists from uh, Bapex were yeah. sitting with you, they had a problem. They had a problem of carrying out the field work, interpreting this, and generating this kind of model. Right. And uh, one of them was mentioning that, can, can David help us in this, yeah. this uh, situation? Right. So my question is that you are going back to California yes, to the, tomorrow. Yeah. Would you, uh, in future, uh -huh. consider coming back to Bangladesh and uh, help these people, these oh, young geologists, yeah. in some way, yeah. uh, making some money with the public? In fact, I would do that. Plus, another way to approach this would be we could um, set up maybe a, a little Zoom situation. Yeah, sure. And I could explain. Um, we have a. I thought. We had it all in a PowerPoint, but it turns out that my, you know, I had a business partner for years, Jay Hampson, and, and we're still good friends, and he's a very good structural geologist. He prepared a, a, a short course years ago, and I thought we had it in PowerPoint, but we didn't. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to get it all in the PowerPoint, and it's very good. It's got exercises, and so we could run through that, and, uh, and you know, that would be a start, you know, given people an idea of how to do it. We used to do this in Mexico. We worked for uh, Panex and uh, the big Mexican oil company. We'd go down there and we'd go around the field a little bit and then we'd teach the class. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll pass on this information. Yeah, at least this one would be in English. That one was in Spanish, and my Spanish is very bad. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you for being with us.